Turn with me to the book of Exodus, and chapter 2, and we're going to begin with verse 16. It's good to see you this morning. I've been looking at these verses and uh, for this week, and there's some very interesting things that are going on in the life of Moses at this time, and I want to relate some of those things into us, as I've said most every Sunday, if, we, if we're just looking at it, at mistakes in the positive things that Moses did, we need to look at how we can gain from these verses. So well, let's begin our study this morning. Uh, we've, we've been with Moses now for some time. God has given him grace uh, through Pharaoh trying to put all the young, men, the young males to death. God put him in the house of Pharaoh. God put in his heart that he was uh, special in the fact that he was the one that God was going to use to lead out the children out of, of Egypt. And Moses took it on himself, and it was the right time, right place, and he was ready to go. So we saw in the last week or two how, how that failed, because it was not God's timing, and Moses was not prepared, and the judgment on the Egyptians were not full yet. So we found him, found him last week as he was running, and, and, and we find him at the land of the Midianites in verse 15. He was down by the well, uh, and I think we talked about somewhat that probably like you and I, when we, we, when we have a failure in our life, we want to stop, we want to say, well, what did I do wrong? And Moses is sitting there, and I believe this is what's going through his mind, maybe what God uh, you told me, my parents told me, and I was ready, but they refused to follow me out. They didn't understand. So what went wrong? So as Moses is sitting there, there's some questions that I want us to think about this morning. Now, when this next 40 years, we'll be, just today's period, we're going to talk about the next 40 years of Moses' life, and Moses is in the house of Jethro, is, was this God's holy and divine plan? Was this God's place for Moses to be in the next 40 years of his life? And uh, most of the time, we would probably uh, think, it, think, yes, God put him there, gave him a house uh, to live in, a home, uh, children. He's using this 40 years to prepare him for the journey ahead of him. But why in the house of Jacob, uh, Jephro? So let's look and see if we can, can, can glean some, some thoughts from these verses that might help us as we're going through this life journey. It's not an easy journey, but we, we journey through this life preparing for the life ahead of us. As, as Moses is going to do, Moses is going to journey through the next 40 years as God prepares him for the time that he will deliver the children of Israel. So in verse 16, we read this in Exodus chapter 2, verse 16. Now the priest of the Medit was seven daughter, had seven daughters, and they came to draw water, and they filled their troughs to water their uh, father's sheep. And then the shepherds came and drove them away, but Moses stood up and, and helped them and watered their flocks. So let's, let's stop there because now we see Moses probably at the well was not sitting right beside the well or on the well case and he was probably hid back just a little way because they didn't see him when they came up neither will the shepherds see him but no moses hears something going on so now the question is what moses what do, what do i do what would i do if i was in moses's case would i rise up to help or would i just let things happen by themselves well, moses heard this not uh, hesitate, he's going to stand up and go to their defense. But let's look at where, where he's at. The priest of Medem. Well, the Mennonites, um, as Jacob is, I mean, I keep saying Jacob, uh, Jephro is the priest. He has the seven daughters. Why did God place him there in the in the land of the Mennonites, because uh, they they and the children of Israel have been in battle against each other from the very get go. Uh, they are our descendants of Abraham, but out of Ishmael. And of course, Moses is a descendant of Abraham out of Isaac. 
And so you can already see there's going to be some conflict. But here Moses is in their, in their household. We see the Mennonites, they recognized Abraham, Jehovah as the one supreme God. They never questioned that. But they also had other gods that they would worship. And they never accepted the, the rules or the commandments that God gave to Abraham about circumcision. They never adopted that. Well, we would think that's a pretty simple thing, but God's not really going to hold accountable for it. just a simple thing, not circumcising their children. But he does. Matter of fact, in a couple of weeks we're going to see, because Moses had not circumcised his sons, that God takes him to the point of death over, over this thing. So this was very important, and the Mennonites didn't do it. And Moses now is, is in their household living with them, and so he's adopted some of this or has not pursued the circumcision of the children. So God's going to bring this to, to him to account for that. But let's look at the verse now in verse 17. And the shepherds, so we know there's more than one. There's several shepherds. They're tough. They're mean. Uh, and they come and they drive away the seven dollars. And then Moses stood up. Well, why would, why would they flee from Moses? These shepherds, by, by the very nature, are aggressive. They're protective. What is it about this one Moses, this one man named Moses, that would cause them to fear and to, to run away from the well, allow Moses to drive their sheep away from the water trough? What, what is it about Moses? It's, 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 a, it's an important issue. It's the same issue that the daughters are going to have. They recognize Moses as an Egyptian and not a Hebrew. So as these shepherds see Moses, they see a man standing there coming toward them. He had the walk of an Egyptian. He talked like an Egyptian. He had on the wardrobe of the Egyptians, and they were not going to battle. So they fled. Do you or do I ever see someone and form my opinion off of appearances? how they appear to be. There's a, a couple farmers, that when I, and I remember them quite well. Uh, they, uh, as most farmers, they wore coveralls, but their coveralls were worn out. Uh, but, uh, and you didn't, wouldn't think they had a nickel. Certainly they wouldn't have a dime. They got in their old trucks one time, one day, and they rode up to a Monroe, and they were going to buy them a new tractor. And no, nobody in the tractor dealership paid them any attention. Or you know who I'm talking about. And uh, because of, why are you going to waste your time with somebody that's not going to buy anything? So they got aggravated. They got in their old trucks, and they drove back down to Marshall, where... Uh, Oliver dealership. Uh, they had a little stock in in, in the Oliver dealership. And he, this is this is coming from from Daddy. He said when when they come down to Marshall to the Oliver dealership, the salesman went out and talked to them, and and they picked out the tractor they wanted. And he said he asked them, well, how do you want to pay for this? And he said, I think it's Tom. When he's in his pocket, pulled out a big old wad of cash. He said, this this, this work. Cash works about all the time, doesn't it? But they had formed an opinion they couldn't buy anything. And we do that, don't we? I was in South Dakota. We were in a motorcycle rally. And I wasn't on my motorcycle. And the one reason I wasn't on my motorcycle is I didn't own one. I was in a nice car. But this beautiful motorcycle, man, that was nice. Much you'd appreciate it. And, and this young couple come over, and they had their children, and they were looking at this motorcycle, and I, th I thought to them, I said, this is not going to end good. And it's huge, man, beard, black jacket on, cow chains hanging down all around him. And he walked over to that parents, and I thought, 
I, I was quite curious to see how he was going to handle it. He said, would you like me to pick your son up and let him sit on it so you can take a picture? My opinion of that man changed, didn't it? As I saw him coming, this is not going to be good. And all was in his heart is to lift that little boy up. So we see, and so these shepherds saw Moses, but not who he was. They saw him as an Egyptian, not a Hebrew. So he, he goes over and he, 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 takes, he, he takes charge. He runs them off, he draws the water, and he, they, and he waters their, their lady sheep. Now, if I look down a little bit further, uh, we find that Re uh, Jephro, they come back sooner than, they, than Jephro would have thought they would have. He said, how, how did this happen? How, how did you do this work so quickly? And if you look at verse 19, and there's another really good biblical thing, uh, statement we can get out of this. So they said an Egyptian. So they had the same appearance that this was an Egyptian because of the way he walked and he talked in his, in his wardrobe. Said he, said he delivered us. He, from the hands of the shepherds, and he, what is more, he even drew the water, and he stayed there, and he watched, he watched, he watered, he protected them even at this point. When I was reading this, I was thinking about uh, wouldn't it been just, wouldn't it have been okay? Wouldn't have Moses met his obligation if he had just simply drove the shepherds off? And then he could have went on down, down the road. That's probably what I would have done. But Moses didn't do that. Moses drove them off, pulled the water, and stood there while the seven daughters watered their sheep. He, went, he was all in, wasn't he? All in. As I was thinking about this, I began to think about my life. And I'm going to ask you whether you're listening online or sitting here with me today. To, to check and see, am I all in? And there's three places I want us to think about. Number one, if, if you're not all in for Jesus Christ, the next two that I'm going to talk about, I can assure you, you're not all in. So, am I all in for Jesus Christ? Do I... And this is, I was sitting there, I'm thinking to myself, do I study and prepare for Sunday morning and get it all I got? Or do I study and prepare just enough to get by? When I was thinking about that, I was thinking about my friend Jerry Knight, because I'll see I'll tell you this too, he went to school just to get by. Right, Jerry? <laughs> but but and we do that sometimes in our Christian life, don't we? Do what just enough to do what to get by. Well, when I'm doing enough to get by, who settles in my mind? If is it is it enough for me to get by? There's another word that uh, we as Christians use quite often. It's content. So in my Christian walk. Am I walking far enough to satisfy, to make me content that I've done enough? I visited a house a number of years ago, some, a couple, they were living here in, in our community, and I, I went to their home and, I, and invited them to come to church. Uh, like any, any good Christian would do, would if you? Somebody in your, you in your community, you're going to go invite them to come to church. And uh, she informed me that uh, she had, was a Sunday school teacher for a number of years, and she had put in her time. I had never experienced that, and, and I almost didn't find words to say, but I did find a few words to say, and they were kind, kind words. <laughs> but she was content because she had taught Sunday school. Now. That's going to carry me to heaven. Well, it might teach in Sunday school will not carry me to heaven. There's a lot of teachers, a lot of preachers that's lost. 
But I, if I can find contentment, so are we all in for Jesus Christ? And you have to ask yourself that because no one else can answer that for you. Are you all in for Jesus? What, I've talked to a lot of preachers, and I'm going to get dead serious. I'm serious. To, most time, if I, you see me out in the yard, I'm, not, I'm picking if you're on. When I'm standing here, I'm serious. I'm, I'm dead serious right now. I talked to a lot of preachers in the last six months, and every one of them I talked to has this very same concern. What's going to happen to the local church? What's going to happen to the local church? And that is a serious, serious concern that we ought to have. And the only answer to that is for the, for the Christian people to answer this question, am I all in? When I, I don't go to ball games, but I talk to a lot of people that do. And they tell me that it's not the same watching a ball game on television as it is to be in there in on the field, watching and hearing and watching people's reaction. So they can they have a need to go to the ball game instead of watching it on TV. I have a need to be in God's house rather than be watching it on my TV or Facebook. I think we need to stop and ask ourselves, am I all in? Am I all in? If I'm not all in for Jesus Christ, the next place you're going to find that I'm going to talk about is you're not all in at home. You can't be all in at home if you're not all in for Jesus. A lot of parents believe this, that I, I provide a house. And you know, there's a difference in a house and a home. I provide a house. I provide shelter. I put shirt, clothes on their backs, and I give them food, and I'm all in. Now, that's the very minimum you can do. That's the very minimum. You're not all in until you, you're deeply concerned about their future, not just their education, but their spiritual future. And sometimes even at work, we do the minimum. Or do I do the maximum? Do I do everything I can? Or do I do the minimum just to feel content in taking a check for it? See, Moses, we see a heart, a passionate heart here of Moses. He didn't just run them away and leave. He drew their water. He stood guard until they left. He was all, all in. Well, guess who took notice of that? Eight people did. Seven daughters and one daddy. What do you think Jeffro was so interested in? He said, where is this man that did all this for you? What, what, he wasn't concerned about it, whether he's an Egyptian or not. He, Jeffro's not. Why do you think Jephro was so interested in this man? Days, the day is a little bit different. You didn't choose who your daughter was to marry, but Jephro had a responsibility. He got seven daughters, and his, his um, obligation, one of them, main one right now, is to get them married off. Who is he looking for? He's looking for somebody that's brave, tough, and doesn't mind working. Guess who fit the bill? Old Moses. <laughs> you see old Jeff Rose. <laughs> Go get that man. Bring him up here. That may not have been the number one reason, but I guarantee you if Jeff Rose had started, I would have thought about that. I got seven girls here. Here's a man that's already defended my, my daughters. Let me meet him. But here's another problem. So they go and they get him and they bring him in. Now look at verse 21. And Moses was willing, and I'm using a different translation today. Uh, your Bible may say content. I like the word content there. 
And Moses was content to dwell with the man. And he gave his daughter, I'm not going to pronounce that, I tried, to Moses. So he gives his daughter to Moses. This sort of goes along with what I was just talking about. And, and Moses is content. Why was Moses content? He was content to dwell. Dwell means to live with. Here's a man that uh, think he can't go back to Egypt because he can't, the Pharaohs want to kill him. So here's a man wanting to settle in, in his household. He's going to feed him and water him and give him a wife and, and the wife's going to give him a son. So why not? Well, this, it seems like everything would be going well for Moses, wouldn't it? So Moses is content. But is he truly content? No. He's not content. He's content of living there, but his heart's not content. And you can be content being in the wrong place. You can be content mentally and not be content spiritually. And this is where Moses was at. Now how do I know that? I know that because that's what the Bible teaches me. If you look at the next verse, we're going to see where Moses, Moses' heart is not in the Midianites. His heart is back, still back with his Hebrew brothers. So look what he names his son. Then she gave birth to a son and named him Gerham. For he said, I have been a sojourner in a foreign land. But Moses names his son the name, I am sojourning in a foreign land. This is not my home. Where is his home? Back where his people were at. In Egypt. So now we're going to have children born out of this marriage. It's going to have Isaac's descendants and Ishmael's descendants. And I really wanted to uh, to learn more about these descendants, but I, I I can't find. I don't know what happened to these boys, and maybe you can search that out. But I know that Moses' heart is not content. He's content with the dwelling place, but his heart's not. Now we're going to, we're going to see now in verse 23, one of the most strangest prayers there is in the Bible. Now listen carefully as I read this. Now it was about the course of, the, of those many days that the king of Egypt died, and the sons or the children of Israel sighed the cause of their bondage, and they cried out, and their cry for help because of their bondage rose up to God. They were crying out to God because of their bondage. Now the Bible tells us that if my people will humble themselves and call on my name, I will hear their call and I will heal their land. If my people will humble themselves and call on my name. Reread that verse and tell me where the repentance or the humbling came in. Israel, the children of Israel sighed because of the bondage and they cried out and their cry for help because of their bondage rose up to God. Where do you see anything about humbling themselves before God? Where do you see anything in that verse about repentance for, for their sins? And they had adopted the, the gods of, of the Egyptians during this uh, 400 years. But you don't see that. You don't see repentance there. You don't see a humbling. They were crying out because they were being, being still in bondage. But what does God do? God hears them. Now, why would God? And you, you tell, I teach, and you, tell, and you believe that God hears the prayer of repentance. Is the first prayer God hears from a person is prayer of repentance. And it's through that prayer of repentance the doors of heaven is opened up to us. We don't have that here, but God hears. Why? I know you know this word, mercy. God's mercy. And there's a couple things here that, that goes with this. 
is number one is mercy. God's got to have mercy on these people. Second thing is Moses is going to be the one to lead them out. Moses has had 40 years of training in the wilderness. Moses, Moses' mind is not ready. His heart's getting there. We'll see next week why I say his mind's not there because Moses don't have any intentions of going back over there. But God will. And the time of the judgment of the Egyptians is now being fulfilled. It's, it's, it's at hand. So God told Abraham they're going to be in bondage for 400 years. It's 400 years almost up. God's going to do what he said he's going to do. He does the same thing for you and, for you and me. When God makes us a promise, so we can rest assured on when has God ever let us down? When has God ever changed his mind? So everything is working that God's going to do what he said he's going to do because of his mercy. It's mercy. How many times has God put a hedge around us? Sometimes we recognize it, sometimes we don't recognize it until we look back and we can see the hand of God. These people are going to look back. What if Moses, 40 years ago, what if Moses... Uh, had, and he did, he, he thought they would leave. What if they had left with Moses 40 years ago? What would have happened? What would have happened to Moses and the children of Israel before they ever got out of Egypt? The Egyptians would have, would have put them back in bondage, killed many of them, because the judgment of God hadn't come. God hadn't brought his judgment on, on the Egyptians. Well, what if they got out of Egypt under Moses 40 years ago and they got down to the Red Sea and the Egyptians coming running up behind them? What's Moses going to do at the Red Sea? He hadn't got his faith is based on his ability. All these things, God's got all his work and his time in it. And we get overly concerned, and we should be concerned, but you know, and we say God's got this and we and he has, but we want it in our timetable. Moses' timetable is now fixing to be fulfilled 40 years after he thought he was ready. So it says, and, and so God remembered them. Now, I'm going to, I'm going to wait on chapter 3 for, till next week because I want us to really spend some time just in a couple of verses here. But God is fixing to prepare Moses. And I'll say this. And, and to let you be thinking about this on the week behind the week coming to prepare yourselves and, per, and I'll be preparing. But look at verse one in chapter three. And Moses was pastoring or feeding or leading the flock of Jephro, his father-in-law, the priest of Media. And he led the flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Sinai, the mountain of God. How many times did things happen to us by accident? How many times things happen to you because you're just lucky? Well, is it by accident that we're going to be seeing that Moses is at Mount Sinai? This is, there's two places in the Bible that you might want to be thinking about that's tremendously important to God above maybe any other place. That's Mount Sinai and his holy city, Jerusalem. What happened at Mount Sinai? Abraham left from there and went into Egypt, got in all kinds of mess. He comes back to Sinai, Mount Sinai, makes, builds an altar, and there he worships God. Jacob worships God at this mountain. God has brought Moses back to this very same mountain, Mount Sinai, to meet with him, to prepare him. We'll find Joshua. Well, Moses, really, when, when he delivers the children out of Egypt, you know where God tells him to bring them? Bring them back here. Bring them back. Joshua will go back to this point. This is an important place in, for God, and God has brought Moses to this mountain, and this is where God is going to give him instructions and put a personal, verbal calling on Moses. So Moses is going to, we're going to find Moses leave, 
uh, is a shepherd of sheep. We're going to find next week God is going to be preparing him for a shepherd of men and a shepherd of God. So the question is, who am I? Am I a shepherd? Am I all in? And this is the question I'm going to leave, leave with you this morning before we close. And I think it's a, if, if we can come to the conclusion of this question and, com, and be completely satisfied with it, the question is, is am I all in for Jesus Christ? Am I all in for Jesus Christ? Or am I content? to be a Christian without being all in. To me, to be all in is to be focused. To me, to be all in is to not walk through fear, to not walk in fear. We're going to meet Jesus Christ. Whether you're listening to me saved or whether you're listening to me lost, you're going to meet Jesus Christ. I think if we search our own hearts this morning, Moses is showing us what it means to be all in. Not doing the least, but doing the most. Did Moses ever have any regrets, regrets of being all in? Moses is going to have a lot of things to be regretful for as he's trying to do, be all in. And you and I, even when we're trying, we're going to mess up. Moses messed up. David messed up. And you can go all through this group and go back to Abraham. I don't know of anybody in the scripture that didn't mess up. I might be thinking Daniel. I can't think of any more particular Daniel messed up. But most of the time we mess up. But God never leaves us, never forsakes us. And all he asks of us to do is be all in. Am I all in for Jesus? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for these verses, Father. We pray that what we said would be pleasing to you. And you might receive glory for it from these verses this morning. Father, that it might be a challenge to, to each one of us to examine our own lives and see, am I all in for you or am I willing just to sit back and be content with what I have? Father, help us search our hearts and our minds. And that's this in our son's holy name.